My position is Vice President for Advancement. My background and experience, I've spent about 30 years um, in higher education across the country, all the way from Alaska to Pennsylvania to Southern California to Nebraska, serving as a Vice President in Enrollment Management, Advancement, and as a President. And, uh, you know, my, my love for that really came from my own undergraduate experience. I'm a first-generation college student. Um, that transformation from kind of a solid blue-collar working-class background to the higher education environment was th this kind of cataclysmic change in my life that opened the world up to me. And I fell in love with it and continued that work and still believe in it and, and that transformational uh, aspect of education. I uh, grew up a mongrel. Um, I was Christian but grew up in a community church, so no um, denominational affiliation, but am Lutheran now. And came to it, I think, mainly because of some of my own experiences in the aspect of grace. Um, this, this idea that it's not something that you work for, it's not a prosperity doctrine, um, and it's something that's freely given. And I think the tension as we wrestle with how do you make sense of that and fulfill a call and a duty in the midst of this free gift um, is what was attractive to me. I explained earlier that I've spent 30 years in higher education and the, the ability to kind of overlay this faith component or undergird a faith component in terms of the work that I've done administratively I think is the biggest attraction. Um, we actually met David Lose uh, eight years ago at Christicon out in the uh, Montana uh, mountains. Um, it was at a retreat um, he was one of the speakers there for continuing education and we got to spend a week with him and had followed his career since then and he became the president here. Um, I was looking, I was finishing up some PhD work in California. We were looking to make a transition to a new career and uh, I simply contacted him and knew that he had an opening in advancement and knew that I would love to work for him. Uh, liked his perspective on seminary education but higher education in particular. Um, reformation of both the church and of leadership and wanted to be a part of that if I could. I've worked in advancement before and made the transition from enrollment management to advancement. Um, you know many people get really um, uncomfortable talking about money. How could you possibly ask people for money? And I don't put it in that perspective. For me it's very much about relationship. You're inviting people to mission. You're inviting people to community. The, the transactional part of it is simply that you're asking for contributions in terms of money and people's time and talent to facilitate that. Uh, it was always interesting to me. I worked for very elite institutions in a couple of roles. Uh, Pitzer College and Franklin and Marshall ranked top 50 institutions in the United States. And in, in that dynamic, people had no discomfort asking for a $200,000 commitment to educate their child. But when you go to people and ask for a commitment that, that's simply a donation to an institution, somehow that gets squeamish for people. Not for the people in the transaction, but others looking from outside. Um, and, and so much of my fundraising work is actually built on a little book that Henry Nouwen wrote um, about the spirituality of fundraising, where he found himself in a situation where he had to fundraise, wasn't comfortable with it, and had to think through some of those issues of his own discomfort. Um, it's something I use in my own fundraising work. Um, even in the secular institutions that I've worked, I've read through that book with my staff and we've talked about those issues and it's certainly something that I'll bring to the uh, work that I do here. And because I don't come, I think, from the traditional aspect of what most people would assume advancement positions would be a former pastor or someone who had been within the church or within the organization for a long period of time. So I recognize that as something coming in that my primary responsibility is to be a quick learner, a good listener, and a keen observer. Um, my job is really to facilitate the vision that Dr. Lose has for this institution, um, both in terms of his understanding of the place as an alum and also what he sees as a vision for seminary education. Uh, everything from how do you take seminary education and make it even more residential and immersive while at the same time reaching out through a distributed learning program so that people can become pastors and trained for, for um, pastoral leadership no matter where they're located. Uh, and, and I think that's the challenge both not just in seminary but in higher education in our society right now. And, and so I'm excited about the possibility but also very aware that uh, I need to be a very good listener as I enter this process. I'm looking for the story of people's lives and how this place has affected it, why it's important, 
But I think the bigger issue is hearkening for all of us back to Luther as the reformer. We're a people of reformation. And what Dr. Lewis is actually offering is an opportunity for seminary education, but also the church to redefine itself. How does it become relevant within contemporary society so that a hundred years from now we're still having this conversation and still challenging ourselves as to remaining relevant within the society in which we live? And I think that's the bigger issue. I mean, that's the bigger challenge is not just do we stay in existence because we've always been here, but is there a purpose for us going forward and how do we evolve into that position? Um, how do we remain relevant and significant in people's lives? And, and I think that my small task on the, on the side of this is making sure that we have the resources in order to do that. The distinction among the Lutheran seminaries for this particular institution is that it is so diverse. Trina and I have had the opportunity to sit in on the Introduction to Public Theology class as we made our transition in, and half of the students in there come out of backgrounds that aren't Lutheran. Um, the, the preaching style and the worship um, that they bring is the world in which we live. And, and so that's a strength that is being brought through this particular institution. Um, and I think it's, it's a framing of the world as it actually exists instead of the world that we hope would exist in the future. Um, and, and it's being redefined. And, you know, I'll just share one story. Last night, every, um, every class, one of the students actually prepares the sermon. Um, last night, their music wasn't working that he was going to use to introduce his sermon, and so he just asked one of the, to the class, does anyone have a song on their heart they'd like to bring? And one of the, you know, women in the class stepped up and went through this spiritual that the other students in the class started participating in, and it's not anything that you would find in our traditional Lutheran worship. And yet, everybody was participating, and I think everybody was moved. Um, and those are the kinds of experiences that we need to have. Uh, a preparation that puts us beyond our boundaries. Many times as Lutherans, I think we get stuck in our head. And sometimes you have to let go of that and actually let the, the, the movement of our emotions and of our entire spirit participate in worship. And I think that's where people found themselves. Trina Johnston is joining me in this enterprise. She's my wife. She's an ordained Lutheran pastor. We've been married for 17 years. We met in Alaska while we worked in the same environment. Um, we're coming here both as vice presidents on David's staff. Um, and the exciting part about it is that, you know, we're, we're best friends. We're colleagues. Um, we're both um, oldest children. <laughs> we have very strong personalities. And so we talked a lot before taking the position about how do we manifest that in our working relationships um, and is it something we want to do where you're essentially now 24-7 um, in each other's work, in each other's worlds, and we see it as an opportunity to manifest ministry. Um, you know, we've always felt that our strongest ministry has been our marriage um, and the way that we can manifest for others this kind of working relationship and partnership. Um, and we have no doubts that there'll be challenges that come with that, but we also know that there'll be deep blessings associated with it as well. In our first um, Introduction to Public Theology class, um, the um, dean of the school, um, Kieran Sebastian, was talking about the history of this place. And when the um, African-American churches in the community went looking for theological training, they came here and the doors were open. And before he could even get to you know, who do you think opened the doors? The people around us, the, the, the women and men who were African American were saying to themselves, the Lutherans. It was the Lutherans. And, and so there's this real power and history and manifestation of a decision that was made decades ago that's having incredible ramifications and movement now that I think we have an opportunity to build on and to embrace in ways that maybe we haven't, particularly from the fundraising side of things.